Loving God, we thank you that you promise to meet us when we gather in your name. Lord, you are here in this place and in our midst, moving by your spirit. Lord, we pray that as we hear from your word today, that we would be reminded of the call that we have to be obedient to you and to follow you with all of life, to be prepared for the day when you return. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And the bridegroom was delayed. Then all the bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. I think that if Jesus told this parable today, he'd tell it about being at the airport. You know, about waiting and a closed door. And I have to tell you, I'm a little bit of an anxious traveler when I fly. I'm not anxious because of flying. I'm not afraid of flying. I know it's safer than driving. I I don't worry about going places. I'm not anxious about that. I'm actually anxious about missing my plane. I always am one of those people, when it says get there two hours early, I want to get there two hours and 15 minutes early because I want to be sure I can get through the security line and find a parking spot and get to the gate before I need to be there so if I need something, I have the time to get up and get it. Because, you know, one time I actually did miss a plane. It was actually a connection. I was flying from one place to another, and I had to connect through Detroit. And I got there, and I just wasn't paying enough attention to how quick my connection was. So I stopped and I looked at a magazine and I grabbed something to eat. And then I got to the gate and just as I got there, they were closing the door and it was too late. So I got to stay in a seedy hotel in Detroit, which is not something I want to do again. So I have this anxiety about missing the plane. I never want to miss it because I want to be on time. I think that if Jesus were to tell this parable today, he might tell a parable about being in the airport, about getting there early, and about a group going where there were wise and foolish people. Now, Bree, I hope this isn't your experience flying to California with a group of, what, 25 or 30 people, uh, where half are wise and half are foolish. You know, but you get there, and I can imagine if Jesus told this parable today, he says, there's 10 travelers going to the airport. Five were wise, five were foolish. Five got in Ryan's car and got there two hours and 15 minutes early. They breezed through the security line, and when they got there, they had time after they sat in the waiting area to grab a sandwich and something to drink. And they ate it, and they were full when they got on the plane. But the five foolish people rode with somebody else. And they got there, and they were in a long security line, and they got delayed. And they were running through the airport like O.J. before he got in big trouble. And... (laughs) and they ran through the airport and then they got up while they were waiting for the plane and they started to announce that they were boarding and they got up and they went and got sandwiches and drinks and when they came back, the door was closed and they missed it. That's how I imagine Jesus would tell this parable today because it's a parable or a story that makes sense to us. And this parable that Jesus tells, he tells a story that in many ways is hard for us to kind of to see exactly how Jesus is framing this because it's so foreign to us. What is happening here? Sorry about this. There we go. Whoops. Can we go back to the... the <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> So we're continuing our series on parables and thinking about kingdom culture, practical wisdom for God's people. And I'm going to give you just a little preview of the conclusion here. I think that the practical wisdom that this parable gives us is this, that God's people are always ready. God's people are always ready. And what are we ready for? We're ready for the return of Christ. 
In this parable, Jesus tells the story of ten bridesmaids, or the literal translation is ten virgins. What's interesting about these ten women is that they're all invited to the party, and they all show up. So the issue is not that they weren't invited. The issue is who's ready for when the bridegroom's co- bridegroom comes. And Jesus tells us that five of the people who came were wise, and five of the people came were foolish. The wise ones brought extra oil and were prepared for a long wait. The five who were foolish brought just enough for the banquet. Now, one of the things that happens when you read about biblical texts is sometimes you find that commentaries are enlightening. Another time you find that commentators commentate so much that you kind of lose the point of the whole story that Jesus is telling. In this parable, when you read commentators, lots of times they want to talk about, well, what kind of lamps were they using? And what kind of flask would they store the oil in? And what are the rituals and what are the traditions of weddings in Jesus' time that they was telling this kind of story? And it turns out that what scholars say is that all of the wedding rituals were so localized that any story that Jesus told was probably accurate for the people he was telling it to. But we think what happened at a wedding like this when Jesus was telling this story is that what happened is the bride, the bride would be waiting at the place where they were going to get married and the groom would come later and he would go with all the bridesmaids and they would lead a procession from one place to another. Usually it was from the groom's house to the bride's house where the wedding would happen and the party would be thrown. And the story is that the bridesmaids come and they've been invited to the wedding, but some of them bring an extra flask of oil because they would lead this procession. There's a question of whether they'd be big lamps or whether they would be torches, but they would be leading this procession at night through the town as they're celebrating this joyful procession, getting ready to go to the wedding. The passage tells us that as they waited... Everyone got tired and they fell asleep. Now in the parable itself, falling asleep, falling asleep is not a judgment on anybody. It's just what happens because they'd been waiting for so very long. But as they were waiting, their lamps were burning and the oil was going down and down and down and down. And eventually, they were almost out of oil in their lamps. And then the announcement comes that the bridegroom is coming. And there's all this excitement And then the foolish virgins are shocked and uh, they're terrified because they don't have enough oil to join the procession. So they say to the ones who brought enough, they said, hey, could you loan some to us? And they said, no. Now, lots of times when people read this passage, the first thing they say is they say, well, maybe the ones who had oil should have been more generous and have shared what they had with the people who didn't have enough. That seems to comport with what Jesus teaches all throughout Scripture. But in this case, we have to remember that parables are told often to make one point, not to make every point. And the point of this parable is not that those who have plenty should share with those who have less, or that the wise should help to carry the foolish along. Instead, the point of this parable is that we are called to be ready for the coming of the bridegroom who is Christ. And they say, no, we can't share with you because there won't be enough. And what's the use What's the use of this procession if all of us run out of oil halfway there? So in a panic, the five foolish virgins run out in the middle of the night. They try to buy some oil, and they find that they can't find any. And they come back eventually, and they go to the place where the party's happening, and the door's locked, and they're closed out, and they're banging on the door. And the bridegroom comes, and he says, Go away, I don't know you. And the parable ends. There are a couple things about this parable that are a little bit on the frightening side. One of them is is that when we read this parable, everyone agrees that this parable is actually telling a story about the church, about God's people. And the terrifying thing about it is it says that there are five, half, who are prepared, and five who are foolish and unprepared. Even in the church, we're told that there are people who are not prepared for the coming of the Lord who aren't really waiting for his return. Whenever I read something like that, I always think, am I one of the ones who is prepared or not prepared? And actually, that's exactly what the parables intended to get you thinking about. 
there's another piece about this parable that is a little bit jarring, especially to modern ears. It's that this parable holds up this idea of accountability. How often do we think, how fully do we believe that we are accountable to the Lord? How often do we imagine that we are accountable for our actions to God? I think one of the things in the contemporary church that's a challenge is that, you know, half the time we're just so glad people show up and we'll let anything go. We have this narrative, which I think has its merits. We have this narrative that says, come as you are because God loves you. And that is absolutely true. It's part of being a church that welcomes everybody through our doors because we want people to know that you don't have to have it together, you don't have to have answers, you don't have to have your life straight to come to church and to worship. You don't have to have any of that to show up. But here's the thing. This passage reminds us that once we're part of the church and once we consider ourselves to be followers of Jesus Christ, there's a sense of accountability and there's a sense of responsibility. We're responsible and accountable to one another, but above all, we are responsible and we are accountable to the Lord. That God has given us a particular way to live. That God has shown us what he wants us to do and who he wants us to be and we are accountable to that standard. I think so often in the church we, we act like that doesn't matter. But it does. And Jesus reminds us of that. And he tells us that if we don't live up to the Lord's standards for us, if we don't try to live in such a way that honors and glorifies him, then we will not be ready for the day that he comes. You know, I think there's another thing that happens, too. When I was in high school, I was part of this big youth group, and I think I was 15 at the time, maybe 14, and we had a speaker come and tell us his life story. And you know when you're like 14 or 15, you have no idea how old anybody is. So this guy was probably 25, and I thought he was ancient. So I'm listening to this guy talk, and he... (laughs) And he's telling this story about his life, about how he lived this life of utter debauchery and, and, you know, just doing everything wrong. And his life was a total mess, and it was falling apart. And then he said, and then, you know, I heard the scripture, and it was like Jesus was talking to me, and I fell on my knees, and I accepted the Lord, and my life was transformed, and I'm living as a new person. And I know why our youth person, our youth director had that person come in, because he had an important story to tell, and it's an important part of the Christian life, and he wanted people to be met where they are and to know that Jesus accepts us as we are and calls us to a new way of life. I know now that that's what he was saying. But when I was 14 or 15 years old, here's how I interpreted that story. Whew, I have all the time in the world. Look at this old guy up here who's telling this story about he messed his life up for years. But he had plenty of time to figure it out. And this was the story I told myself when I was a teenager. I have all the time in the world to figure this out, so I'm just going to wait and do what I want to do, and then someday when I need it, I'll turn to Jesus. I don't think it's just teenagers who think that way. I think lots of us think that way. We kind of go through the motions. We kind of act like, you know, eventually we'll figure it out and get it together. And when we do, God will be there waiting for me. But there's this hard reality of life that all of us deep down know is true, even though we don't hold it in our conscious mind all the time. This deep down truth of life is is that we don't have any guarantees. The only guarantee you have is this moment. You aren't even guaranteed the rest of the day. And one day we will all be held to account. We'll be held to account by the Lord for for what we've done and for 
the one in whom we put our trust. So when I think about this parable that Jesus tells about being ready all the time, he's talking to people like us. And what he's saying is don't delay and don't wait and be ready for the day that I return or the day that I call you home. So you might be asking, well, how do I do that? Well, in this parable, commentators and scholars tell us that the question really at the heart of it is, what is the oil in the lamp? What's the oil that you bring that that prepares you for the coming of the Lord? And you know, when you read about preaching, you read that preachers only have two or three sermons in them, and they tell you the same sermon over and over again. And as I was writing this, I thought, this is probably one of those two or three sermons that you may have heard from me before. But you've heard it from me before because I think it is the centerpiece of living out the good news of the gospel, of living as a follower of Jesus. I think lots of times we think it's like a puzzle that we have to figure out. Or there's some equation that when we get it figured, it all becomes easy. Or that we believe that somehow if we do some complicated something, We'll get it all worked out, and then we'll really be living in a way that pleases God. But I've discovered, and I know that Scripture tells us that that's not true. There is no trick, there's no great mystery to living a faithful Christian life. The truth is that living a faithful Christian life is comprised of little things of taking steps day by day that are faithful and that are accountable to the Lord. Now for some of us, those steps are are pretty simple things. In a lot of cases, those those steps that prepare us for the day when Christ calls us home or when he returns, those steps are things that are like habits that we form. For some of us, For most of us, they should be things like daily scripture reading so that we hear and listen to the word of the Lord in such a way that he speaks into our lives and helps shape who we are and how we view the world. It also means things like daily prayer, that committing to pray every day for yourself, for your family, for your church, for the world, and for the people that you know. To lift these things up throughout the day and to live our lives in the presence of the Lord day by day and moment by moment. But it also includes other simple and ordinary things. It means asking God to give us awareness of the people around us so that we see the needs of people around us and we meet them in the name of Jesus. It means things like asking God to give to us as gifts the fruit of the Spirit so that what we do in our lives in a day-to-day and practical and ordinary ways looks like Jesus. Being ready, being ready all the time, means living in such a way that we are consciously thinking about what does this say about me and what does it say about God as one who is a representative of the Lord in my day-to-day life. For many of us, it means very simple things, like like being disciplined in what we say and how we say things. It means being disciplined in what we watch and what we take in, because we want to live lives that are honoring to God. For us, it means things like being disciplined in generosity, giving to the work of the Lord, because that's what he's commanded of us, and doing it generously, and with joy. I think that the oil in the lamps is that ordinary, everyday stuff where the Spirit is at work in us, bearing witness to the world, to the goodness of God. Scholars tell us that this parable is actually connected to the parable of the sheep and the goats, thematically. You know that parable? The one where it says, that at the end of days, the Lord will divide the sheep from the goats. And the goats he'll cast into outer darkness, and the sheep he'll welcome into his presence. And then those who are goats will say, Lord, Lord, we, 
we don't know. Why are, why are we sent off here? He says, did you see me hungry? Did you see me thirsty? Did you see me naked? You didn't clothe me. You didn't feed me. You didn't give me anything to drink. And to those on his right, they'll say, Lord, when did we see you do these things? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Being ready all the time means living in such a way that we live to bear witness to the goodness of God. That we live in such a way that we live our lives knowing we are in the presence of God and we are accountable to Him. And when we do this day by day and moment by moment, we will find that we are ready for the day that He returns or calls us home. So that we live in such a way that God is glorified through us and in us and that we are ready for that day when he comes let us pray Lord we pray that we would be accountable to you God we pray that we would live our lives in such a way that we remember that we live our lives in your sight all the time God not in fear of judgment but instead as a way of thinking about what you would have us do so that you will be honored and glorified and pleased. God, for those of us who need to be more disciplined, we pray that you would, by your Spirit, give us the spirit of discipline so that we can pick up these daily things that will help us to be closer to you and to hear your voice. God, for those of us who need to be freed from burdens, we pray, God, that by your Spirit, you would give us liberty to help us to walk away from things that hold us back and chain us to this world. God, for those of us who need to be more aware of the people around us, we pray that by your Spirit you would open our eyes so that we are able to see the people around us and respond with love and with grace. Lord, for all of us, we pray that you would help us to remember that we are accountable to you to live our lives in such a way that we are ready for your return or the day that you call us home. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.